This is a short video to allow you to figure out how to do the calculations in lab 10, which is a specific heat of a metal lab. So there's a variety of data points we're going to collect in this laboratory. So first off, we need both the mass of the water within the calorimeter and the mass of the lead weight. You can find those on the JetNet page. Then we're going to measure number of temperatures. We're going to measure the initial temperature of the water in the calorimeter and the initial temperature of the lead weight. Now the initial temperature of the lead weight is going to be equal to the boiling water it's placed in. Boiling water gets to 100 degrees Celsius, so if we leave the lead weight in there for a period of time, it will absorb the energy to the point that it gets to 100 degrees Celsius. Now the final temperature, the temperature of the calorimeter at the end, is equal to both the temperature of the water in the calorimeter and the temperature of the lead weight because the temperature of the water in the calorimeter doesn't stop changing until it's equal to that of the lead weight that we put in there. The last two things we have are the C of water which is the specific heat of water. We know that. It's 4.1840 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then what we're trying to figure out which is the specific heat of the lead. That's our unknown. So let's look at how we do this calculation. Okay, our first question. Difference in temperature of the water. We know that when the lead goes into the water, after we take it out of the boiling water and we stick it into the calorimeter, it dumps heat into the calorimeter. The calorimeter absorbs energy out of that hot lead weight. That's gonna raise the temperature of the water. So we're looking for the difference in that temperature, the difference between the initial and the final state. So that's a simple subtraction. So, Again, as always, I am using made up data just to show you how the calculations work. You need to do the calculations with the data that's actually in the laboratory. So if our initial temperature of water was 25 degrees Celsius, roughly room temperature, right? And after we put the lead weight in there, it continues to rise until it gets to a maximum of 28.9 degrees Celsius. We would look at the difference between those two numbers, 28.9 minus 25, giving us a difference of positive 3.9 degrees Celsius. This is an important thing to remember. The difference in the temperature is always the final minus the initial. The sign of this value matters, okay? So this is 3.9 degrees Celsius, which means it absorbed energy. A positive, a positive temperature difference means it absorbed energy, okay? Now, our second thing is we need to figure out the heat. How much energy was absorbed by that water? Now we can do that with the heat equation. Q equals mc delta T. We just have to make sure we have all the components of that. Well, we measured the mass of the water in the calorimeter. Again, that's on JetNet, right? So that's mass of water. We just calculated the difference in temperature in question one, so that's delta T. And we know the specific heat of water because that's a constant, 4.1840 joules per gram degree Celsius. So we can calculate Q. Now the calculation for Q is pretty straightforward. Q equals mc delta T. We know m, we know c, we know delta T, so we just plug them into the equation and we get 815.88 joules, right? Now realistically this would be to three significant figures and you're like wait why three? Delta T has two. Remember delta T is a derived unit. Delta T is taken from values that have three significant figures, right? If we go back to question one, you would see that both the temperature measurements have three significant figures. We don't count intermediate values as binding significant figures. We only count the original data, right? And our original data are mass and our temperatures. Okay? So our mass is to three significant figures and our temperatures, our original temperatures are three significant figures. So this would be bound to three significant figures. Now I've pulled a couple extra ones out because this is an intermediate value also, we're not stopping here. But if we were to stop here, if I was to ask you on a test, well, what is the Q, right? The Q would be 816 joules, because that would be to three significant figures. But we're gonna carry a couple extra significant figures over for our next things. Because all we've got here is how much energy the water absorbed, okay? Now you'll do this for each of the trials, right? You can end up with multiple values. So you can do this for each of the trials. The next thing you need to do is you need to get the, the information together to figure out the material, the lead's properties. So one of the first things we gotta do is figure out the delta T of lead. Now, we know the initial temperature of the lead was 100 degrees Celsius. 
We know this because we put it in boiling water, and since it was in boiling water, it equilibrated to the boiling water, so 100 degrees Celsius. Now we need to know the final temperature. Well, the final temperature of the lead is equal to the final temperature of the water. Like I said, it will stop when the two are equal to each other, the water and the lead weight. So if the final temperature of the water is one thing, it's the same as the final temperature of the lead. So again, delta T of the metal is a pretty straightforward calculation, but it is important to remember, delta T is always final minus initial. So in this case, that means 28.9 minus 100, giving us a delta T of minus 71.1 degrees Celsius, all right? Minus 71.1 degrees Celsius, meaning it dropped 71 degrees. That's important, the sign is important. We'll talk about why in a second. So to wrap all this together in question four, question four is where the magic comes together. Now, if I rewrite the lab at some point, I'm probably gonna split this into like question four and question four A or question five and then move everything else down. Because we're actually doing two things at the same time. So the first thing we're doing is realizing that the law of conservation of energy tells us I can't create or destroy energy in a closed system. And a calorimeter is a closed system, right? So any energy released by the lead has to be absorbed by the water. So backwards, the energy we calculated as absorbed by the water has to be equal to the energy released by the lead, right? So we know Q of lead. We know it because it's the opposite of Q of water. So how do we denote that mathematically? Well, that's where that phrase Q of lead equals minus Q of water comes into play, right? By changing the sign, we're saying it goes from absorbed in the case of the water to released in the case of the lead, right? A positive Q value means you absorbed energy. A negative Q value means you released energy. So we can use this together with the mass of the lead, which we know, and the delta T of the lead, which we just calculated in question three, to figure out the C of the lead, okay? So we know the mass, we know the delta T, and we now know the Q, because we take the Q we got for water and we change the sign. So instead of 115.88 joules, it becomes minus 815.88 joules, all right? So again, we're back to our original equation, Q equals MC delta T. But I'm not solving for Q anymore. I'm solving for C. So I have to rearrange the equation. So C is going to be equal to Q divided by M delta T, right? So again, algebraic rearrangement. So that would put Q on top, minus 815.88 joules over we're gonna say our lead weight's 15 grams. Again, this is made up data, right? Times minus 71.1 degrees Celsius. Now note, there's gonna be a minus on the top, minus on the bottom, they're gonna cancel each other out, and you're gonna get a positive value for the constant. That's why the sign's important. If you forgot to put one of those in the right sign, you would end up with a negative constant value, and that's not right. So those two negatives cancel each other. You get, in this case with our data, a positive value of 0.765 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, obviously, you can tell this is made up data because that's nowhere near the actual predicted value that you guys got in your work, all right, when you were doing your pre-lab. So, question five and question six, just like last time, question five, take the average of the three values you determine in question four. So you take those three C values from each of the trials, right, which calculated in question four, just get the average from them. And last, compare yours to the percent error, get a percent error from the known value. Now here's a little bit of a twist in it. You might have come up with two possible known values, one about somewhere around 0.12 something and another one 0.16 something. Both of them are right. The reason comes down to there are multiple ways to calculate specific heat, multiple kind of, um, assumptions you put on the system, right? And both those values are accurate within the assumptions they make, all right? So either one of them's fine. The 0.12 value actually is closer to the assumptions we make, but either one of them is valid. So whichever one you used for question one in your pre-lab, assuming it was one of those two, um, be sure to use here so you can see the difference between them. 
So hopefully this helps you get through the calculations for lab 10. Uh, as a note, uh, lab 11 I'm rewriting currently. I will get it up before midweek. All right. Talk to you guys later. Bye.